What kind of ghost would haunt an Adam and Eve store? This is the story of the ghost that haunted the Adam and Eve store. Probably he had his reasons. I never got the full story before, but when I took over the shop, I found out that the shop was haunted. They dropped it as casual as it could be. I was going to change the place and turn it into a McDonald's, but there was this issue with the previous haunting of what used to be an Adam and Eve store. There was just something about it that was stopping the customers from ever coming in, and I knew it could later have an effect on my business when I open up, so I decided to sit with the previous owner to make sure what happened in that place. The owner told me the story. It all started in 1800s. This store served as the brothel to the town, and young girls and women were out here selling themselves for the night, so the night would bring a lot of filth to the town. Now, in this town, everyone is quite liberated when it comes to sex, but it wasn't always the case. The brothel was despised by the local woman, and they even protested to get it removed, but certain men in power did not want that to happen because of the revenue they were getting, and more than that, because of the leverage that the ladies in brothel had over those sleazy men. The mayor of town Barrington wanted no part in the demolition of the brothel, and himself had a lot of times tried to save the brothel by providing it necessary funds from the bank. Some said that it was as a matter of fact run by the mayor himself, but they were all accusations. The mayor claimed when in question, he said in the town meeting, the brothel brings in visitors to the town. That brings in new customers to the businesses. If you are ready to say goodbye to that, then I can propose the demolition of the brothel. And everyone in the town hall was quiet, and that was the end of the discussion for closing of brothel. There were churchgoers and god people who did not want any part in the town that would involve themselves in such sinful trade, and they decided to protest at the mayor's office and stood outside, demanding mayor to close the brothel. But the mayor wasn't ready to do that, so in return, he decided to talk to one of the pastors in the church who took confessions and called him in for a meeting, and they sat down. And the mayor started without stopping, told him everything and every reason why he can't destroy the brothel. He said, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned a lot. You see, Father, I have done something. The devil have a power over me. Around two years ago, when I had the bad fight with my wife, I came to the town and I saw a girl, Mary Lou. She was pretty. She was 17 at the time, and I was just smitten by the way she looked. She was like a sunshine that she calmed my anger. I decided to bet her father, and that night, that is what I did. I bed Mary Lou, and come morning, I realized what I had done, and I wanted nothing but to change what had happened. But in that guilt, there was the pleasure, and pleasure was winning. I was cheating on my wife with Mary Lou, but I still loved my wife. And then one day, Mary Lou tells me that I put a baby in her belly, and that just made me nervous. It was around the time when everyone wanted the brothel to shut down. In rage, I slapped Mary Lou, and she fell and hit her head on the corner of the bed, and I had no intention to do so, but that killed her. Now I wanted to come clean, but the ladies in the brothel said that they won't breathe a word to anyone if I let the brothel kept open. So they have the power over me, Father. I cannot let the brothel go away. And then the father slowly smiled and put his firm hand on the shoulders of Barrington and said, Burn your sins, son, all of them. Once they are burnt, no accusations will be laid upon you. And then the very next day, the news broke out in the town. The brothel was lit on fire, and everyone inside of it died. No woman, no customer survived the fire, and everyone died. And then, as the years passed, the property was passed from owners to owners, and everybody complained about the place being out of ordinary and disturbing. They even said that they witnessed a stray young girl walking around the halls. It wasn't until we opened an Adam and Eve store here that we saw it for the first time. Sex was symbolic to this store, and so the opening of our store called the apparitions to break loose and wreak havoc. That is why it is just third month and we have to close the shop. Hope McDonald's will bring in something better. They finished their story, 
and I realized that this place is not the right place for business, and I didn't even stay a week, and thank God I didn't. I would have lost more in that place. Now it is just an abandoned building. No Adam and Eve store, no McDonald's. Just an abandoned building for the ghosts to roam freely. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. In the early 1800s, a carpenter called Rudy lived in a quite frugal life. He was a carpenter in a small town, and mostly focused on small jobs of the local people of the place, and people instead paid him with the food and clothes and everything else. He claimed the money is no use for him, so he put in there a barter system with the villagers, where he would do work for them, and then in return, they would provide him with all the things that were needed for him to live by. He once made a pair of teak chairs for the local woodworker in the village, and in return, he graced him with every time he had the spare woods, and then he would in return make things that he liked for himself with them, like the clock, and all the little toys he would make out of the spare wood, and then distribute it among the children, which made him famous among all the kids in the village. He tried having his own child, but every time he tried with his wife, he failed and he did wanted to have a child for so long that he almost started being desperate and often spent his time around everyone else's child. And then one day, when trying again, he realized that his wife failed to give him a child yet again. And then he had a big fight with his wife and told her to leave him as she is not fruitful enough to bear him a child. Everyone knew about their big fight, but at the same time, everyone was sad for them. And then one day, the news broke out that her wife left him for another man, as she believed it was the carpenter who wasn't competent enough to bear the woman a child, and to prove her point, she decided that she will run away with some young craftsman and have his baby to prove that it was not her who is the problem. And she did that, and that rendered the carpenter heartbroken. He was a mess after knowing that he couldn't be a father anymore. And now with his wife run away, there was no chance that he could feel the joy of being a father again. And that made him sad and bitter every day as it passed. It wasn't until one fine day in the conversation with the local pastor that the man came with the idea and with the idea of hope. The conversation with the pastor gave him the very hope that he was so much willing to have. The pastor said, you are a fine man, young Rudy, a brilliant craftsman at that. There is so much that you can do. With God-given skill of carving wood, why don't you carve yourself a young boy, Rudy? And if God be willing, he will put in the life in the boy and you'll be a father. The idea of the pastor seems preposterous to the carpenter for once, and he knew that there was no way that it could happen. But then it seemed to have gotten embedded into his mind, and he was constantly thinking about what Pastor said. But being the craftsman he was rooting, knew there was no miracle that God would do, and he knew the only logical way was to find a new wife and then be with her and try to conceive a child. And then he set on the search to find someone who would be willing to do it. And then one of the ladies was called in to find a suitable woman for the carpenter. The woman set out to find a suitable lady for the carpenter, and in search asked every other woman if she wanted to wed the carpenter, but none of the ladies that were approached agreed to it. The carpenter was frustrated by it, and asked the lady to find her the woman who can bear him the sons or the daughter he so desperately wanted to be a father of, and to him, it the only thing that he said he was missing in his life. And the lady promised him, that she will find him one in the next three days, even if she is the young one. And then she went away. And then three days later, when the lady couldn't find him any, she came back to the shop and saw that the man had built a wooden figure of a boy, which opened like a casket. And then when the lady came in and told him that she hasn't been able to find a new lady for him to wed, she came back and saw the figure and was puzzled by it and asked the carpenter what it was. The carpenter opened up the casket a little, 
and what she saw next scared him. She saw it was her boy who was being put into that box by the carpenter. And then the carpenter approached and said, You haven't been able to find me a suitable lady. And since you haven't been able to do it, I have no option. But I have to get a baby with you if no one can get it. And she was scared and shouting and asking the carpenter to leave her and her child. Then the carpenter said, You promised me, but you didn't. And it was important for me. You know how much I want it. And then the man moved forward and started forcing himself upon the woman. And as he did, the woman couldn't do anything. And then after it was done, the man opened the face part of the wooden casket. And the boy was able to breathe. And then he tied up the woman and went on to do the work he does. And then later on, he would come back from work and then get on and force himself on the woman. And he kept doing that until she was pregnant. And every time he forced himself, he would free the kid more. And then later on, after a month, the lady was already pregnant. And she was even freed before. And she stayed. Even though she was living with the man who forced himself upon her, probably Stockholm Syndrome. She was a widow, but weirdly fell in love with the carpenter, for he cared for the boy and released him and the woman only a week later. But she stayed, since she was a widow in the small town of Italy, and being with Rudy was her sense of security. Rudy and the widow did have a child with him, but then the child died seven months later. The carpenter adopted the young boy of the widow, They had the funeral for the child, and he was buried in a wooden casket that looked a lot like Pinocchio. The town showed up at the funeral, and was equally weird out by the relationship the man and the widow had in the Pinocchio casket in which the dead child was buried. This problem is still technically going on, but because of recent events I think it will be safe to share it here. To be brief, I had purchased a high chair for an upcoming baby shower. The family member already had a similar chair and I decided to keep it for future births. A year or more passed before I was notified of a recall of that specific item. Several children had been injured by it. I took it to the store I purchased it from just as the site instructed to get a refund. The young man at the counter greeted me with a kind smile and I informed him of the situation. The encounter got very weird after that. I'm not sure if he was trying to be funny, but the way he said it sounded very vindictive. We wouldn't want one of your little angels hanging himself, would we? It wasn't just what he said. He had a creepy smile as he said it. I became livid and demanded to talk to his manager. She soon came out of a back room and I explained exactly what had occurred. When confronted, he insisted it was just a joke. I'm unsure of what occurred after that. The manager relieved him and her and I completed the return. I'd go on with my life and things were normal for the next week. The young man had all but completely disappeared from my memory. The following weekend I found myself shopping in the very same store. My son was riding in the basket seat just like he always did. I happened to run into an old friend from high school. I was very excited to see her. I briefly lost focus on my son. My back was turned for literally no more than a minute. The two of us were talking when she pointed behind me and asked if I knew the boy who was pushing my son up and down the aisle. This caused me to come unglued. I turned to see the very same young man pushing the cart holding my son back in my direction. As the cart approached, I screamed at the man to let go. My son, who had up until that moment been having a blast, saw my reaction and began crying. Much as before, the young man had a very casual reaction to the situation. He said something to the effect of, Oh, calm down, lady. The kid's just having fun until you started freaking out. Now he's crying. It's no big deal. You should take a chill. A crowd had begun to assemble around us. Among the group was a store manager. He asked if he could help. I explained and demanded the police be called. We all returned to the office to discuss the incident. Somehow, he managed to convince me the cops weren't needed and assured me the young man was going to be terminated. It seemed like a just punishment. So, I agreed and left the store with no intention of ever returning. Now, 
We come to this past week. Since the terrifying interaction I had with the young man, I had been staying close to home. Briefly, I thought that he may try to get revenge on me for getting him fired, but a month had passed without any problems. Food was starting to run low. I made my way across town to another store I sometimes shopped at. This place was actually less expensive, but I disliked the quality of their products and avoided it. My shopping experience went off with no problems and the cashier was very courteous. It was looking as if this place wasn't that bad after all. That was until I was loading my groceries into my van. Everything was put away and I turned to return the cart to a nearby corral. As I looked up, my eyes lock with those of a young man. The very same I've been having so much trouble with recently. It was like he'd appeared out of thin air. He had a smirk on his face and seemed to get a kick out of scaring me. He quietly chuckled before speaking. Your psycho behavior caused me to lose my job. But I wasn't fired like you wanted. I've been there so long, they, they just let me quit. And now I'm working here. I was hoping I'd gotten away from you, but it looks like you have some crazy vendetta against me, lady. If you know what's good for you, you won't come back here. When he finished, he turned and walked back toward the store. In a panic, I just jumped in my car and locked the doors. I looked back and forth between the mirrors, half expecting him to just magically appear next to me. The tears came next. They lasted several minutes until I was able to regain my composure and drive away. I knew now that I had to do something. I decided to stop in at the police station to see if I could get a restraining order. An officer heard my story and told me in not so many words that I had no grounds. No matter what I said, I was unable to convince him. Eventually, he came up with an idea. He promised to talk to the young man about his behavior. It was far from what I wanted, but I was going to have to accept it. A few days passed and the officer called to let me know that they had spoken, and it had gone well. The boy agreed to stay away from me and I assured the officer that I would do the same, and I thanked him and ended the call. As I'm writing this, the date is November 8th, a Monday. It's been six days since I last spoke to the young man. With little other choice, I have returned to shopping at the first store I spoke of. There's been no sign of trouble. I'm hoping the officer's talk put a little bit of fear of God into him. He sounded very confident in his assessment. I'm sure the police would know better about these things than I do. Yet there's a nagging little voice in the back of my mind. And something tells me I haven't seen the last of him. This happened back in 2009, but after finding this sub, I felt compelled to share. My husband and I were 21, just moved into our first apartment, and I was about six months pregnant. The small one-bedroom apartment we found wasn't one of those nicer, corporately-owned communities. It was more like a slumlord situation, but rent was cheap, and we were just getting started in life. A little backstory... The city we were in was still close to family and my husband had a great aunt we knew lived nearby. She was one of those family members we would only see at big family reunions so it wasn't like we had a close relationship. As a great aunt, she was one of like 13 children, you know back in the day when everyone had a thousand kids, and she had been married for many years with four of her own children. They were all mostly grown up but being that this was over a decade ago, her youngest was maybe 16 or so at the time. We hardly ever saw him at reunions because he was one of those gang-banging kids that was always getting into trouble. Apart from his poor choices, he was born with a very striking facial deformity that really gave him a unique appearance. We'll call him E. So we had just moved in two weeks prior to this incident... I was only working part-time, so I came home early in the day and continued to unpack and organize until my husband got home in the evenings. Our then-English bulldog was my faithful companion, and although they have a lazy stigma, she was a great guard dog. So it was early evening and there was still light out when I started hearing banging or prying of some sort coming from the back of the apartment where our bedroom was. On the other side of our bedroom... The back wall faced the parking lot, so we got a significant amount of noise when people came and went. 
At first, I figured it had to be a gardener or someone loading things from their car. As the noise continued, I realized it was right up against that wall. I peeked out our window, but due to the angle, I really couldn't see much. This noise obviously aggravated our dog, who wouldn't stop burfing. You dog owners know what I'm talking about. And it was starting to make me scared. Cheap rent came with some shady neighbors, and we quickly realized this wasn't going to be a long-term residence. So, this noise continued. My dog continued to burf, and I was getting freaked out because I couldn't see anything outside our window and I didn't have the guts to go investigate. I was really pregnant, and I don't like running even when not pregnant. Finally, my husband made it home just as it's getting dark, and at this point, I hadn't heard the noise for nearly an hour. Of course, I tell him right away that I had been freaked out for the last few hours because of banging, prying, and moving going on outside. So yes, he went to investigate and came back saying nothing seemed out of place. Later that same night, we had made dinner, eaten, and my husband was shaving in the bathroom getting ready to take a shower before bed. Suddenly I hear him yell, Hey! in the deepest booming voice I had ever heard. I come quickly running to the living room and I see my husband and his boxers stretch from just outside the bathtub with both his hands on the small windows still inside the shower and tub. I ask him what happened and he turns with an alarming look on his face and says, Someone's cut the screen. I had chills go straight down my spine and was basically frozen. He yelled for them to get out of here. When some more movement started happening and he slammed the window shut and locked it. This is the uncomfortable part. As soon as he turned around again, out of breath, he says to me, That was my cousin E. I was so shocked. I asked him if he was sure and he says he could recognize that face anywhere. And then he started questioning what the odds were that E recognized him. And to this day, we really didn't know. Immediately following the incident, we had the manager replace the screen and I placed a dowel in the window to keep it shut. We lasted nine months in that complex and will never rent from a slumlord again. We have also not seen E since even before the incident at a family reunion. About two years ago, we found out he had been incarcerated and isn't due to be released until 2022. We don't know what the charges were. The family keeps the situation hush-hush, but I truly hope we don't ever see him again.